Welcome to Opposing Views, a hard and straightforward discussion of today's most relevant issues. Tonight, we are airing from the Asian Development Bank as Solar News Channel partners with the University of the Philippines Debate Society in its 2014 Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championship. We've got the best, we've got the brightest, we've got the biggest debating teams in the country tonight, and as if we haven't had enough of the summer heat. We'll turn on the heat some more as we now officially open the final round of the 2014 Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championships. Good evening, I'm Rod Depomuseno, and this is Opposing Views. Now let's introduce the debating teams competing for the final round tonight. From the UP Debate Society, Jose Fernando Escalante. We also have Maggie Del Valle, and we have Leomar Jose Doctolero. And for the Ateneo Debate Society, Alan Arthur Cabrera. We have Paulina Blanca Robles. And we also have Bharat Keswani. We'd also like to introduce uh, our judges for tonight. We have Jake Bustos, Sayed Sadiq, Marco Sana, Elmer Cruz, Paolo Teodoro, Mark Kitoy, Richard Dapasen, Alan Barsena, and Kelly Abagat. So thank you, thank you teams, and thank you judges. All right, let's proceed to the debate proper. We call first from the government side. Leomar Jose Doctolero, the Prime Minister. You have seven minutes for your speech, and the leader of the opposition, Barat Keswan, will follow with his speech also for seven minutes, and your time begins the moment you speak. Government will tell you about the story of the Zabalin people in Egypt, the poor and disenfranchised lower and middle classes in Egypt, who decided to go beyond the structural limitations that were imposed upon themselves, and decided to work scavenging jobs, and decided to go waste disposal jobs to be able to uplift themselves from poverty. Currently, the Zabalin are a staple in Egyptian society. They are respected as individuals with their rights. They are respected as individuals who are crucial parts of the community at the end day. UPD is not going to shy away from its burden. And we are going to admit that sometimes there are structural limitations to how people can access their rights. Sometimes people have unequal access to education. Sometimes people have an access, uh, unequal access to housing or food security. But we think the simple question of this debate is, given those restrictions and given those unequal opportunities, what is the responsibility of those leaders, of these leaders that we're talking about, tribal leaders, religious leaders, over the disenfranchised communities and we believe in three things number one that these communities should never pin their efforts for self-sustainability on reform from an external institution in this case a state they should never trust the state to be able to give them what they deserve that's first but second we argue that hard work is the goal what is hard work hard work is about creating and exploring new opportunities beyond the opportunities that are already existent that's first but second it's even we're even willing to agree that it's about having to work harder than other will do in your situation. So thirdly, we argue that this, uh, this idea is eventually going to lead to better integration and development for these communities with the, the rest of the society in the long term. I have three arguments for you. Number one, I'm going to talk about sustainable development and why development is going to be sustainable, obviously, for these communities if you have government's policy. Second, I'll talk about integration with the rest of the society in the long term and how that's essentially going to be better under our side. And third, I'm going to analyze for you best case and worst case scenarios and why we take both, both sides. Let's argue the first one, why the claiming of success for themselves is better. Let's first understand what would the leader tell these people under government. Point. 
The leader is simply going to tell, after first argument, the leader is simply going to tell these people that you have to be able to claim success for yourselves, that you have to go beyond the structural limitations that are already in place. Why do we think is that ultimately better? What you have to understand, Mr. Speaker, is that support systems are unsustainable when there is no commensurate effort from the people. So when people don't reciprocate the support coming from the government, then ultimately all, all those support systems are eventually going to go to waste. We see this, for example, in the example of the American Indians. They were made citizens in 1901 with the ultimate goal that they will access employment, that they will eventually integrate with society. But since they don't have that incentive within themselves to say we have to work too, then ultimately what happens is that they're still, they're still disenfranchised, they're still, they're still not accessing the rights at the end day. So number one, since support systems are unsustainable when there is no commensurate effort, we argue that the better situation therefore is to form that base or to form that base, prepare from the base, uh, prepare from the base and essentially form that effort at the end day. So that's the first part of this argument. Point. But the second part of this argument is you also have to prepare for situations where the state might take away or the state might not give permanently the kind of support system that it necessarily has at the end day. We're talking about politically volatile situations, for example, where these people are never going to be trusted for more than a couple of months at the end day. And we argue that in those situations, it's better Point. on the our side where these people are going to be self-sustaining regardless of whether or not the government supports them. What you ultimately have to understand about this argument is the dependence and the right of those people to be able to express themselves shouldn't be contingent upon others accepting them and upon others recognizing them. As an American Indian, or if an American Indian were to be respected, it's not because the Americans decided to respect him, but it's because the American Indian decided to respect himself and essentially work for that. Before I move on, second Why is second it argument. fair to put the burden on the marginalized to prove themselves a thousand times more than the privileged in an oppressive system. One, we already agreed that there are structural limitations. But what you have to understand about the incentives of state is that they're not going to provide just unequal opportunities. We think eventually they will have to equalize the opportunities. But this debate is about whether you're going to actively support them, like affirmative action policies at the end day. So we think there are still equal opportunities that are still going to exist under our side. And we're not supporting that, obviously, coming from UPDA. Second argument, how do you best get integration in the long term? If you analyze movements which have succeeded, Mr. Speaker, it's always because of moral ascendancy. Why? Simply because people have always appreciated more the, that equa the, the fact that people rise above the lines that were set for them and people do make an active effort. Why is this particularly important? Because the main concern that people have with these disenfranchised communities is if we give them their rights, would they be able to make use of it at the end day? So the, the, the fact that we are forcing them to hard work is the answer to that question. That even if they're not given opportunities, they're already hardworking. They're already working for their own and they're already prove to be deserving of that right at the end day. Conversely, we're going to say, if you start from the situation where people don't yet prove themselves to be worthy, you breed aggression and you breed repression. You see this in the example, for example, of the African Americans in the universities. Fine, they might be given affirmative action and privileged treatment, but people don't believe that they deserve those affirmative action and people still feel that they are disenfranchised by those particular policies at the end day. So the second argument essentially points to this simple conclusion that um, people are only going to appreciate the, the people are only going to appreciate your humanity people are only going to give you what you deserve if you start working for it first and not vice versa at the end day thirdly we're going to argue why even in our worst case uh, even yeah even in our, our worst case we will still be proud to propose this policy you have to understand that a worst case of government is people are going to be working hard or people are going to be working hard but the opposite uh, but the government is never going to be willing to give them the support the worst case coming from opposition when people lose their incentives to be able to to work hard because they're pushing for reform or they're waiting for reform at the end day is that people are just going to be stuck waiting people are going to be stuck waiting in squalor with no opportunities to be able to work harder with no incentive to be able to work harder and with no incentive to transgress and go beyond the current situation at the end day so fine in our worst case the government institutions might not be there to support you but the fact that you've proven yourselves to be worthy is going to mean that one that is extremely unlikely but secondly even in the most unlikely situation you've proven yourselves worthy anyway and you don't need the government institution at the end day let's remember the case of the Zabalin again when they 
when the government decided to step in and give them equal opportunity, what eventually happened is that these Zabaline people were dispersed, these Zabaline people were disrespected, and these Zabaline people no longer had good lifestyles. For all those reasons, and for all the people who, proved, who want to prove themselves worthy through sweat and blood and not tears at the end of the day, UPDA is proud to propose. I thank the Prime Minister. I now call on the Leader of Opposition. The previous speaker talked a lot about hard work and trying to prove yourself in a society where he agrees there are systematic levels of oppression. The problem with that is he has to show us how hard work is going to make it so that you can succeed in systems of oppression when he agreed that people need to be self-sustaining but the only hope they had that was provided by government was for the affirmative action in governments to eventually step in because you work hard. We think that coming from government, they had to show us why affirmative action was going to be a result of hard work and we think that hard work in fact makes it so that affirmative action is much more far off and we think that in order to get affirmative action, you have to realize that you are not in a position where you are going to be advantaged and you need help from the state and no matter how hard you work it is the state that failed you and the only way you can succeed is through the state which is why the stance coming from opposition is very simple while we recognize that leaders like may have uh, might point out outliers of disenfranchised people who are able to succeed through hard work we think leaders should tell its constituents that, the, that they, in order for them to succeed and get through inequality they have to challenge the systematically oppressive structures that face them right now so it isn't by trying to work hard, work hard within these structures but it's by challenging these structures and telling yourself no it's not because of you but it's because of the system that's failed you no thank you what are examples of very like, oppressive structures? Firstly, we want to take a look at how there is a larger evalu uh, evalu evaluation of white collar jobs over blue collar jobs, for instance. Or the idea that contractualization is a system that continually oppresses people in terms of how hard they work, no matter how hard they try at any point in time. We think that any, like, any system will always tell you to try and fight structures, which is what we're, something we're for coming from our side. But before we talk about our arguments, let's respond to a couple of ideas from the previous speaker. First, let's take a look at their ridiculous stance. So he starts off his speech by saying, we don't think you should pin this on the state, but I have to act independently. But if you take a look at a lot of his conclusions at the end, it all results to affirmative action being given to you by the state. So Sir. I don't understand. If you don't think you should be reliant on the state, why, are you th why is the hope of all these oppressed people that affirmative action will eventually get to them because they worked hard enough? We don't see how this is an analogous to a stance. We think there is a vast contradiction there. But secondly, we think that how will you get this affirmative action if you don't push the state to provide it to you regardless of how hard you work? Because we would say coming from opposition is that it is not your burden to work hard in order to receive affirmative action, but you should point out the structural inequalities and that the state should provide you with that affirmative action because of these inequalities. We think the only way you're going to get affirmative action is by pointing out the inequalities and not being a part of the system that will continually entrench you over and over again. We think their model only makes it so that it becomes harder to recognize these inequalities without pointing them out at all. Next, he talks about how these people need to work hard so they can go beyond their limitation. Firstly, there was just like tautological arguments about how if you work hard, you will get through without showing us how they're going to get through. Like if you are a janitor who works a nine to five job, how are you going to work very, very hard and clean every single corner in this hall room, but still eventually get a better job if that was your structural disadvantage? We don't think he showed that completely and we don't think that it was perfectly okay for him to just rely on governments eventually bailing them out without showing us how this was going to work under their model. On to my arguments. Firstly, the first question we need to ask is what are the obligations of leaders of disenfranchised communities and what should their message be to fulfill these obligations? Firstly, we want to talk about three oppressive structures. The first structure is the idea Sir? of opportunities. No, thank you. We think that people who are disenfranchised have al are already at a disadvantage because of the opportunities presented to them. For instance, if you come from a very poor background, it is very unlikely that you can afford to go to Ivy League school. Oftentimes, these schools will also have legacy, pro legacy programs where if you are someone who is a rich affluent family who has parents who already went to Harvard, the chances of you going to Harvard after is a lot higher because of your parents. We think society is very similar to these legacy policies. 
You are only going to be successful if your parents were successful, if you came from a successful background. We think these are all structural barriers that already disadvantage people from oppressive and disenfranchised societies, and we don't think that this side of the house deals with that completely. Because all they simply did was agree that these structural barriers exist without proving to us why it was the burden of these individuals to fight the structural barriers they already conceded exist and to prove themselves beyond these sure. barriers when the average person who are already given these opportunities don't have to to do the same, we don't think it's a fair standard. No, thank you. Next, let's talk about the evaluation of jobs. The premise here is that because they lack opportunities, it becomes a lot more difficult for them to achieve high quality jobs that are of higher value. If you take a look at a lot of the examples of people who are disenfranchised, oftentimes they have very low quality jobs that require very low skill because they don't have an Ivy League diploma and, and give you very low pay as well. What does this show you? It shows you that people will evaluate people under these jobs as people who are unimportant and people who have caps in terms of how high their success can be. Because ideally, if you are a janitor, if you're someone who's a sales clerk, your, society, like your, your capabilities of being able to move upward already has a cap as far as it can go. Like no matter how hard you work as a janitor, there's no award that says you will be the best janitor in the Philippines, for instance. There is no way you can get out of your position. And we think in this instance, it is oftentimes because of the evaluation of their jobs and the priority that their jobs are given. We think because there's no Point. upward mobilization, we think it is far, far more unlikely for you to ever move up within society. And I'll take you after this point. Here, here. The third idea is the idea of contractualization. We think contractualization makes it so that the jobs these people have become very replaceable to the point where if you decide to challenge the system, you will be replaced. And we think in this instance, no matter how hard you work, a rotating cycle of changing individuals, employees, will always make it that you come back to that same circle, and we don't think that's fair. Before I move on, go ahead. Sir, you're pushing an unequal burden. How will challenging the system work with, without an incentive from the people to give it to you anyway? Okay, that, that'll lead me perfectly to the third idea. How do we challenge the systems, and what should leaders do to reinforce challenging the system? Thirdly, the idea of how realistic your message should be to your constituents. What do we think leaders should say? Leaders need to explain to their members that no matter how hard they work, they need to have realistic expectations of what they're going to have under their own societies and their own compromises. What this means is they need to start to challenge the system that failed them instead of trying to blame themselves for the problems they're approaching, being approached with. What are examples of this? We think there are lots of groups that have disenfranchised groups that already uphold this system in value. We're talking about Akbayan, for instance. We're talking about Gabriela, Anak Pawis. These are all organizations that tell you that no matter how hard you work, you need to challenge this oppressive system that's stopping you from ever trying to succeed. We think that oftentimes fighting against the system is what will push government government to change the system, which is where we get things like labor standards, which is where we get things like trying to have labor unions and better health care for the poor. If you force people to challenge the system, the government has to respond. But if you pretend like there's nothing wrong at all and work as hard as you can, that problem will never be highlighted. And for all those reasons, we are extremely proud to oppose. Thank you. We'll be back after a short break. Meanwhile, you can also join the debate online. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash solar opposing views. Follow us also on Twitter at opposing underscore views. Use the hashtag opposing views PIDC. Stay tuned. You're watching Opposing Views special coverage of the 2014 Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championship. Welcome back. You're still watching Opposing Views special coverage of the 2014 Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championship. Now, let's call the Deputy Prime Minister, Maggie Del Valle, to further advance the argument of the government side. Maggie, you have seven minutes. And the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Alan Arthur Cabrera, will follow with a speech for another seven minutes. In an ideal world, Disenfranchised communities should get their rights without having to bargain for it. 
Indigenous communities should be able to get the ancestral lands without having to fight for it in yalis, without having to bargain with your legislature, for example. But you have to be able to live in a reality where these kinds of things don't happen. That's why, when opposition asks the basic question of why is, this, is it the community's burden to be able to prove their rights, the answer is fairly simple. It's because there is no other way. In status quo, people tend to be selfish, and states would not rather give the, their lands, for example, to indigenous communities because they believe that these kinds of lands could have been used for economic purposes. They believe, for example, that economic resources should, be, should not be given to the poor, but should rather be given to the elites that will necessarily empower their own states. We think, therefore, that what opposition has to be able to prove in this particular debate is that their rallies will work, is that people will actually get, get their rights. We're just waiting for the state to do something and not really engaging hard work. We think that they haven't really proven that coming from previous speaker, and that's the reason why they still can't win. I want to talk about two points of response coming from the previous speaker. Before I move on, yes. Okay. The way that blacks were accepted is by challenging the structure and the norms. Why do you think then it's impossible if we've shown in the past that it can happen? The blacks actually challenge the structure, but they also worked hard. We don't understand why it doesn't have to start with hard work and the campaign that leaders should be able to launch at this point. I want to talk about two points in response um, come, uh, to address the speech of the previous speaker from opposition. First, the idea I want to be able to respond to is that you will, not, never able, you will never be able to gain your rights and affirmative action if you don't exactly wait for the state. In the Philippines, we talk about indigenous peoples' rights. We are lucky because the state actually budged. In 1992, we, we passed our EPRA, right? We passed the, bill, the, the law that will necessarily empower our indigenous peoples to get their resources. But states don't always budge, and that is the case around the world. We talk about the Pomahakan in Bangkok, for example, who have been bargaining for their rights for the longest time, but never really got Ma anything. We talk about the Orang Asli in Malaysia, who have, have, who have been isolated for the longest time just because they had, they, the state is very much unwilling to be able to change their constitution that says that the Orang Asli are not Malaysians. We think these kinds of things happen all over the world, and they have to be able to prove that these kinds of things will change if you just rally and don't do the hard work that we told you, have to be campaigned with the leaders coming from our model. But the second thing have, we have to be able to respond to, sit down, is this idea that working alone will not work. You always have to work for the state. We already told you coming from Liamar that the Zabalin, for example, in Egypt, has been, ha, is a group that was able to do this, this thing precisely. If there are groups that succeed that, we don't understand why these, uh, but the other minorities and the other disenfranchised communities cannot be able to do this. But then, coming from Bart, sit down, um, he also said that, well, if you work hard, you will only do odd jobs like being a janitor or being a sales clerk. One, this is absolutely insulting. I don't understand why the janitors or the sales clerks, sales, sales clerks don't necessarily feel empowered. What we argue coming from our side is that your big changes of achieving rights on the state level are things that will only start if at the personal level you are empowered. I'm going to talk about in my argument, how is it that these people will never be able to achieve their rights if they don't do this hard work campaign that we're talking about. Sit down. On the first case, I want to talk about the idea that leaders hard work, the leaders' hard work campaign is the only campaign that you, can only, that you can have for empowerment. Because the problem of disenfranchised communities and status quo does not end with plain poverty and lack of resources. It extends to isolation, it extends to discrimination, and absolutely this extends, this extends to disempowerment. Point. Sit down. And by disempowerment, we mean it's the feeling that they can't personally do anything about their situation. It's the sentiment that they have to be able to wait for the state for their situation to improve. Or it's even the mentality that they have to absolutely accept whatever is offered to them because probably that's the only opportunity that they're going to have. Sit down. And this is precisely the experience of our poor Filipino far farmers in the province, for example, who do have to sell their crops for a very low price because they think that's the only time that they can sell anyway. It's the same experience where indigenous communities sit down Question. when they actually sign contracts with mining companies and accept the money even at the sacrifice of their rights. We think the empowerment campaign tells the people that these kinds of things aren't true and should be changed. You're talking about the, the idea Farmers should actually make the effort to consolidate, their, to consolidate, for example, um, and make sure that they can collectively bargain for their rights and the right prices of their crops. You're talking about the ability of indigenous communities to actually sit down, struggle, uh, take the struggle to be able to campaign for their rights. We think this, the hard work we're talking about in this debate doesn't necessarily just have to be, to, to be their idea of maybe just to toiling in the soil, for example. What we're saying is that hard work also includes your ability to make the effort to make the change for yourself. And this is precisely the description we gave you coming from Leomar. We don't understand why they can't engage it. Ultimately, when you talk about the idea, sit down, if being able to make sure that people are empowered, we think the model of government is the only thing that you can have. But on the second level, I want to talk about how hard work campaigns sit this. down. 
harder campaign allows the disenfranchised communities to be able to gain political capital. Because the strongest rhetoric against affirmative action, against any disenfranchised community in status quo, is the idea that this tolerates the undeserving. The rhetoric is that, well, the rhetoric, for example, is used to be able to deprive the indigenous communities of their lands. This is used, for example, when you want to be able to deprive people of CCTs and other affirmative action policies. Um. Sit down. What you're saying is that, and this kind of uh, proposal, this kind of model that you get coming from opposition only worsens these kinds of rhetorics. Without the hard work campaign, the only reply communities can give is that, well, as Ina said, we deserve our rights, right? That's a reason that, and it worked, for example, in the United States, sit down. In the case of indigenous communities, the first reason why they were able to bargain for the rights, for example, in the international community and in the United Nations is because they said, well, we deserve it, we were in the land first. And it worked. For governments, it worked. For the international communities, it worked. But you talk about the people on the state, the people outside your government, for example, who feel that you're just being unfair to, the, to them, essentially. These are people who never really accepted the indigenous peoples. These are people who never really accepted the poor because they think, well, you're just tolerating people who don't really deserve to get these kinds of exclusive rights. What we're saying is that when you have leaders actively campaigning for hard work, and people actually see that kind of campaign, and these people actually work, then they will realize that, well, maybe it's worth it to actually help them. Because they are people who are helpful, they are people who are going to be beneficial for us anyway. And then look at the campaign for migrant, migrant rights, for example. The first steps, the first steps that you're able to achieve these kinds of things where people actually realize that these migrant workers aren't just random workers that we can dispose of. When they finally realize that these are people who deserve human rights and can be helpful to us anyway, then that is the only time that these kinds of rights were actually achieved. Therefore, what we say coming from government is a simple battle cry. We think people have to be empowered at the personal level because before they can actually bargain for the rights that opposition want to be able to achieve for them. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister. I now call on the Deputy Leader of Opposition. The world is harsh and unfair, we agree. This reality, however, is never an excuse for why it should be that way and for why we should tolerate the injustices that are far too real in status quo. If you take a look at where humanity is today, we are here today because we were not afraid to turn this world into the world that it should be, rather than to settle the world as we see it today. We think, ladies and gentlemen, Affirmative was far too pessimistic in this debate when they said that, oh, change is too far off that, oh, we will never realize change in our lifetimes. But if you take a look at every single significant change in terms of human history, it has come because people will, were willing to challenge the system, even if it came at the cost of their welfare today. We think, ladies and gentlemen, there's a particularly noble cause which we think these leaders of disenfranchised communities should commit their people to. I'm going to discuss in extension why the rhetoric of hard work equals poverty alleviation is damaging to the treatment of the poor and the ability to challenge the system overall. But before that, let's engage with a couple of things that came from the previous speaker. First, when we asked in a POI and we talked to you about the African Americans who challenged the structure, the previous speaker glibly said, well, they challenged the structure, but they also worked hard. What she's trying to do is that she's trying to have their cake and eat it too. This is a principled concession, ladies and gentlemen, that challenging the structure is important. But in this debate, you have to weigh, what do we value more? Challenging Sir. the structure or working hard? In this where, again, we go back to the example of African Americans. We think that the hard work of these African Americans was only recognized when there are structural changes that began to see them as humans in the first place. Because without this structural change to see them as humans, it was not considered hard work because they were merely considered as beasts of burden who were doing their natural job. We think, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot appreciate and reward hard work without the structural change. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, we do not understand the rhetoric of when other people see hard work other, when, when people see that the poor are working hard, they will necessarily want to help. Sir. Because what they fail to understand in this debate is that hard work comes from a very nuanced lens and a very nuanced perspective. If you are a CEO who is earning millions and millions and you pass by the janitor in your corridor who only earns one over one thousandth of what you actually earn, in your mind, because that is a system of the valuation of labor, you are thinking that you are doing more hard work than him. So we think that they're not 
necessarily changing any perspective because the rich and the elite will always treat blue-collar labor if we do not challenge the structure as things that are, do not classify as hard work. We think, ladies and gentlemen, that is the reality that they have to come, come to terms with. But most importantly, there was this question coming from Bart that the previous speaker was unable to answer. What is the incentive of states, of corporations, to initiate reform when the people never challenge the system or do at least don't challenge the system as strongly as they do in the status quo. Because the society that they want to create sounds awfully like a society with limited dissent where you choose to remain silent even in the face of oppressive structures. If you are the government and you do not see any rallies or riots in your street, you will think that everything is fine and dandy when the reality is it is so far from that. We think, ladies and gentlemen, if you take a look at the status quo, there is already so much dissent that is fruitless, that is not leading to reform. So, in a world wherein we take out all of that dissent, where will the reform come from? That was a crucial question, which was never answered by any of the speakers of the affirmative bench. Let's take a look at my argument. Why do we think that the rhetoric of hard work equals poverty alleviation is damaging to the treatment of the poor? If you take a look at the logical consequence of the rhetoric that hard work equals poverty alleviation, you simplify the narrative of poverty into something as simple as, if you are still poor, you must not be working hard. We think that this is harmful for a couple of reasons. One, for the poor. It gives them unrealistic expectations about what hard work truly offers them. Because in all reality, these guys want to believe that, oh, Sir. they want to be realistic, no thank you. But in reality, hard work as a tool for poverty alleviation is the outlier rather than a rule. But when you create a relationship that hard work equals poverty alleviation, you make people believe that they are the outliers, even when statistically speaking, that is highly unlikely. We think, ladies and gentlemen, there are many consequences of of these false expectations. For instance, people taking on unreasonably high student loans because they believe that they can work multiple jobs and work it off anyway. We think, ladies and gentlemen, student loans have pushed people to the brink of desperation to the point that, for instance, that Duke freshman needed to become a porn star in order to pay for her student loans. We think that this is massively oppressive, especially in the, in the instance when she didn't want that for herself. But now that we've discussed the perspective of the poor and how this creates the own self-perception, let's take a look at the perspective of the rich. The important question in, the, in this debate is, what is the push or the incentive Sir? for society to change oppressive structures when all your suffering and poverty is a consequence of your own doing? But before that, sure. If people don't do anything about their current situation, isn't that one of the primary reasons why people remain poor? We think, ladies and gentlemen, that it may be the direct and immediate reason for why you have nothing to eat tomorrow, but if you try to assess why people remain poor intergenerationally, why my father, my father's father, and even my child will be poor, it is because you do not challenge the structure, and you rather think of what will come tomorrow. We think, ladies and gentlemen, we ought not to tolerate this logic. But let's go back. We think, ladies and gentlemen, when you use this rhetoric, the state will say you have nobody to blame but yourself, and the state can therefore wash its hands off any obligation to guarantee you basic rights. We think, for instance, this makes states less willing to extend welfare to those who need it the most. If you are familiar with the Republican Party caricature of the welfare queen, what they are doing to oppose social welfare in the United States is by portraying everybody who lives off welfare as people who do not do hard work, as people who just lie down and leech off the, inter leech off the, leech off the resources and the progress of the state. We think think that in reality, while people do work hard, while people do indeed, while people do indeed work hard, the fact that their, their, that their hard work is not recognized is precisely because you do not even challenge the system to begin with and you do not begin to change how this hard work is appreciated and is valued. What you need to understand at the very end of this debate is fairly simple. We do agree, ladies and gentlemen, and even these guys agree that there are a lot of structural changes and a lot of structural injustices that occur. And the most important question is, how do you come to challenge these social structures and these unjust structures? When will the government or when will these corporations ever be held accountable if you tell the poor to remain silent? We think that this affirmative proposal is a, terribly, it's a terrible idea and for all of these reasons, we're proud to stand in opposition. Thank you. All right, we'll take a short break. More speeches from the government and the opposition sides when we come back. Please stay with us.
Welcome back. You're still watching Opposing Views on the Solar News Channel. We are airing from the Asian Development Bank for the special coverage of the 2014 Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championships. Now, let's continue on the heated debate. Now, let's call the government whip by Jose Fernando Escalante, followed by the opposition whip for another seven minutes, Paulina Blanca Robles. This debate is not an either-or scenario we're in. We're going to ask people to work hard and ultimately give up the fight for their rights. Perhaps it is a prerequisite or a step before we do that step, before we do that action. We have to remember that at some point, people will be asking the government for these rights because these are conditions that we cannot avoid. These are conditions that we cannot deny are harming individuals. Therefore, this is an expected eventual consequence that individuals will ask their governments for these rights. The question of this debate then is simple. Under what condition will the government and society who is predisposed to harm us more convinced that we suddenly deserve this right and it's about time for us to be given those particular rights at the end of the day? Which is the first target of my first issue about the mobilization of solutions. Because their first uh, reservation in this debate is a simple question. Why is it worth it to place the burden on ourselves, even if we are the marginalized individuals, such as IPs, for example, Jose. or disenfranchised community? First, it's true we think it's unfair, Jose. but because ideally we were born equal later. But in a society groomed to maintain prejudices to the way that this to the way that they serve their rights has been allocated, you always have to understand that before these steps are always initiated, we started somewhere else. For example, black slaves were never given the opportunity to study, but it was hard work. They did not complain. They snuck in trying to read the manuscripts of their slave owners, for example, and trying to find a way to figure out what those letters mean. Eventually, they started asking for their rights, perhaps, but it was easier when there was a black person, for example, capable of reading and writing and telling other people that we are enslaved and it's so sad and we have to fight for these rights. Eventually, they were given education, but they were segregated, but they worked hard within that system. They did not automatically complain, but they suited themselves and used whatever they are given at that moment so that eventually they can bargain for additional rights. You abolish segregation, but you had implicit discrimination that happened in society. Eventually, you used your education in your desegregated community to be able to interact to other people, white people, people of different religion. And all of these things were never an excuse for them to just complain, but they were always first used by these people against the state that has been oppressing them. Therefore, the hard work that we are describing on our side perhaps might be disempowering because at some point, people had to settle with what is given by the state and they were not complaining. But in reality, they're just using what they will eventually use against the state the moment they wanted to start bargaining. Now, how do we incline the state then to give us these benefits? And here's where Leo Mar was largely sure. unresponded to. When we talked about the idea of a moral ascendancy, because if you try to look at it, put it on a table. An individual who just complained and whined about the rights that he's not rece receiving versus an IP community, for example, that number one, is disenfranchised when it comes to education, but loaned their land and their houses so that they can send one individual to school, ended up graduating with BS education, and that person goes back to the community and teaches other individuals out there. That is a scenario wherein hard work is displayed by the community even despite the structural disadvantages presented to them. It is better and it's more convincing for a society predisposed to hate them because you present them with an antithesis of their expectation of you. That you are just a community that is worth disenfranchising, that you are just a community that will just end up de demonstrating all along. They told us that it's about time for us, for the leaders, to convince the people at the end of the day to stand up for their rights, but they never really contextualize what happens when people go full-time when it comes to fighting for their rights. Normally, it transcends activism that these people don't work because they spend most of their time going to different communities, complaining to the government, filing certain things, and they are the ones who are leading rallies. If you try to look at how they are perceived in status quo, true, what they're fighting for is really beneficial, but eventually they are just perceived sure. as individuals who block the traffic and cause businesses to suffer because roads are always blocked by all of the rallies even if they were necessarily important. That is the harm when you just automatically complain about it without using the system and settling with what you have first. Now, 
Maggie's empowerment argument is the second crucial issue. It's about protecting the community. Because if you try to look at it, do you have to set a certain mentality towards the community for us to breed that type of empowerment within them? If you try to look at it, why is the type of solution coming from our, our side more important? We gave you the example of farmers, for example, that are entering into collective bargaining agreements. It was never mandated by the state. They are the ones who created the system that we must pull in our resources and set sure. a certain price and not allow the buyers to dictate the prices of rice because we must be able to dictate them because we are the ones who are using our, up our resources. Sure. And in this case, you are able sure. to come up with solutions that are dictated sure. by the persons who need them, not, by the, uh, not a solution that just comes out from the heaven from the state, even if it might not necessarily be working. We gave you the example of American Indians, for example. We thought that citizenship is the way sure. to go for them, but they eventually just did not use that citizenship because it was not appro appropriated to the type of culture that they have. But before sure. I proceed to the other issues of this debate, yeah. The problem with your solution is that it just assumes that someone's going to eventually work hard and get an education degree. But what are the steps about working hard from, your, from being an indigenous person to getting a degree and how do you get from A to B? Tell them that you can't rely on the state, that ultimately if you want to get that education, perhaps you have to go part-time, perhaps you have to spend more time. Normally, it's as simple as that. You don't have to tell them, for example, that it's a complex scenario. It's just that you are not going to get money from the state and if you want money coming out of there, you have to find a work. Now, let's talk about the protection of the community and why they're not protecting that interest. Because you try to look at it, LO said, let's give them real expectations. When you go to the corporate field, this is the glass ceiling. Isn't that disempowering when you tell them that this is your limit and you have just to work with it and start complaining about it? We think that the, when you try to look at poor people, it was always about telling them that it is within their capacity to change their own conditions. Not that they are just purely reliant on the state and what the state wants them to do. We think that the empowerment coming from our side stems from the idea that we tell them that the agency lies within them but never ultimately coming from the state. What is the benefit of our side? Even in the instance that the state does not give you your right, even in the instance that the state is not listening to you, these people will live by. You might think that they are conditions that are bad, but given the example of my prime minister with the Zabalin, for example, they are individuals still that are collecting garbage, but they are able to sell this to communities, for example, garbage, for example, that end up getting fed to pigs, for example, that are supporting certain farms in Egypt. If you try to look at it, see, when it, when it comes to the maintaining all of these solutions, it is still contingent on not burdening the state too much with whatever you expect the state to give you because you think that you deserved it ultimately. We think that in the scenario where in, there is a possibility that the state might reverse its condition, the state no longer has the capital to support you, at least we gave the people the capacity to fend off for themselves and not completely rely on the state. We think that this is the sustainability argument that they have yet to respond to. Thanks. I thank the government whip. I now call on the opposition whip. The idea that you are poor because you are lazy, because you do not work hard, is precisely the kind of elitist mindset we want to get rid of. This mentality is outright offensive because it's blind to the reality that many marginalized individuals that work very, very hard face. Right? In, even if they work for hours and hours in the day, it's impossible to be able to transcend these structures because they are vulnerable. They do not have enough power to be able to challenge the state. They do not have enough power to be able to challenge these big corporations. That was the disgusting narrative that UPD wants to defend, and we think that there are two questions which will crystallize this debate for Ateneo A. First, is it responsible for leaders to say that hard work solves poverty? And second, where is poverty more likely to be alleviated? First, on the idea, is it responsible for leaders to say that hard work solves poverty? Because coming from Leomar, he tells us that people, we must tell marginalized individuals that regardless of oppressive structures, they must work hard to transcend it. No, thank you. Principally, we already told you that this is unjust. It is unjust to put the burden on the marginalized to prove themselves a thousand times more than priv the privileged individuals just because the system favors the elite. But more than that, we think that it's an absolute lie that these people in poverty can always transcend structural barriers. Ma'am. Right? No, thank you. For example, it's hard to demand more than minimum wage or even minimum wage when you are in poverty, when you are very hungry, when you don't have an education. It's very hard 
hard for you to be able to demand for a humane workplace because the characterization of affirmative bench is that they are already very desperate. They are already very hungry. And that's why transcending these structural barriers Point. become almost impossible on the side of the affirmative bench because there's no incentive for them to do so at the point in which they are desperate. The problem that affirmative bench was blind to is this idea that they don't have any bargaining chip with the state. No, thank you. They don't have any bargaining chip with the, gover uh, with the corporations, right? So even if you do get a job, your success relies on the benevolence of the rich. It relies on the idea that the rich is willing to give you minimum wage of 400 pesos. It relies on the idea that only the rich is willing to give you a humane workplace. So even if you get far under the model of the affirmative bench, that isn't because of hard work, but rather because the rich individuals chose to be nice to you. And that's what we don't want to depend on. We right, don't want to depend on this idea that their basic human rights, no thank you, that basic decency is accorded to them through these rich individuals. And that's precisely why we want Point. to challenge the structure. Go on. When you fight for your rights, the provision of your rights is also contingent to the benevolence of the state or to the benevolence of other sectors that will eventually provide you those rights. It's the same condition. But how will they know that you are unhappy with the state you are in at the point in which you decide to continue to work in that oppressive system, right? Because the problem with them is that they agree that we need to challenge the structure, but how are they ever going to challenge it if they don't want to stir up dissent? In the status Girl. quo, there's already so much dissent, and yet the abuses still happen to these poor individuals, we think that it's going to be worse off under their model. No, thank you. We told you, coming from negative, that you must fix the system. Because it's the only time when you fix the system which your hard work will be valued fairly. Because under the affirmative bench, even if you work very hard, Concession. even if you work eight hours a day, no, thank you, it is irrelevant if the structure does not recognize that hard work in the first place. It's irrelevant if the elite does not recognize that we want to pay you a lot of money, right? So it's irresponsible for leaders to say that hard work solves poverty because it's simply untrue. If UPD conceded that their goal is also to change these structures, we think that staying silent, allowing yourself to be abused is not the way to change those structures. Second, where is poverty more likely to be alleviated? Because coming from Liamar and coming from Maggie, they tell us that hard work will get you far. And it was only Jose who told us that the way it gets you far is if the community presents hard work first, and that's why they're appreciated. Firstly, we think that we're already against this idea that you rely on the benevolence of the rich. But secondly, if you work hard in a system without complaining and you say that I'm just going to continue working and I'm perfectly fine and I'm going to wait for a miracle one day that the structure will change, we think that's less likely to happen, right? Especially when the rich have an incentive to be able to rationalize your choice to work there and not complain as a form of consent to those abusive structures. So again, if UPD tells us they want to change the structures, they never ever told us how. No, thank you. Secondly, we told you that because we question coming from NEG, how will your hard work get you anywhere if the structure is so that people do not appreciate you? We told you that hard work is essential to progressing, but it's only at the point in which the system can recognize their efforts. Alan gave you the example of the idea of black individuals. We tell you that they worked hard for the longest time, right? And it's unfair to say that they only work hard at the point in which they were recognized. For the longest time, they've always worked hard. They have been slaves to a lot of white individuals. But the way that we were able to see that they were also human beings is when you had people like Rosa Parks work say that we are challenging the system, that you are not appreciating us for our worth. So they have been working for the longest time, but the only time that we recognize that they are also human beings that deserve respect is when we decided to change the system. There was no response to this coming from UPD, especially if they conceded that it's important to challenge the system. Why is it that we don't do it head on as opposed to working hard in the hopes of maybe in the future that will lead to challenging the system? That's a speculative benefit that they never bothered to defend. What we told you coming from the Al from Alan is that the narrative that the la you are lazy, that's why you're poor, is harmful to the goal of challenging the structure. They never responded to this. We told you that those poor individuals will create unrealistic expectations that allow them to drown in student loans, and that's a direct harm to them they never bothered to respond to. But secondly, this idea that the rich and state will always be able to rationalize that they do not need to change anything, that it's always the fault of the poor, that we don't want to extend 
extend welfare to them, that we don't want to increase mi minimum wage is something that is harmful, especially if Affirmative Bench already says that we need to change the status quo. So we think that under UPD side, what they're saying is you can have both. But coming from Alan, we told you these things are mutually exclusive. Because the minute that you forward the idea that hard work is the way for you to become successful, you remove attention from the idea that structures need to be changed. And that's precisely why we can't have both. The, because Ateneo is the only one who gave you exclusive benefits, and we're only the ones who debated the real debate, we're proud to take this championship. We're taking a short break. Don't go away. When we come back, the reply of the government and the opposition sides. Stay tuned. You are watching Opposing Views. Welcome back. You're still watching Opposing Views special coverage of the 2014 Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championships. We're getting towards the last portions of the debate. Let's now have the opposition reply by Alan Cabrera. You have four minutes. And after that, four minutes will also be given to Leomar Dr. Lero for the government's reply. Let's take a look at two things in assessing this debate. First is on structural reform and second is on poverty alleviation. On the idea of structural reform, what we saw coming from UPD was a shifting in contradictory stance. Because Leomar began this debate by saying, oh, do not hang your hat on government reform because it will never come, because it is so unlikely. Suddenly, when Bart, raised, when Bart challenged that leader of opposition and we raised several POIs, UPD was probably very impressed by the rhetoric because they decided to drop Leomar and instead say, you can ask for structural reforms later. We think Leomar we think, number one, that was an explicit contradiction of what Leomar said about never wanting to hang your hats on structural reform. But secondly, there was no explanation as to why we can hang our hats on structural reform later, but we can't do it now. Like, what is really the difference between later and now if there will always be poverty, if, we'll, if there will be always be oppression? But thirdly, it was very, very strange for them to say, you can ask for structural reforms later when the substantive tirade of the, op of the government Whip speaker was suddenly about all of the hor all of the harms of demanding for structural reform. When he said that you bother society, that you create traffic, that you make people dislike you, we think, ladies and gentlemen, all of these are arguments as to why, in their world, asking for structural reform is never a good thing. Because whether we do it now or later, there will always be traffic. There will always be who people who will be opposed to your structural reform. So the important question that they need to answer and that they fail to answer is when will you demand for structural reform if not now? And this is where the second part of this idea of structural reform comes in. We need to weigh the likelihoods for reform. Because it's not fair to let AF get away with, oh, we can reform later, baka next year, five years from now. We, we don't really know because they were very vague about that. But what we did for you in this debate is to weigh the likelihoods of when reform can happen. I told you in my speech that right now, with lots of dissent in society, there is already very limited reform. What more if you tell everybody, don't complain, it's your fault, you better work harder. And we think, ladies and gentlemen, this is precisely the rhetoric that even doesn't allow the state to be, begin to understand where the reform should come from. So even in terms of weighing where reform is more likely, we think that reform is more likely when there is dissent, when people are challenging the structure actively instead of focusing on working hard. The second thing is about poverty alleviation. We appreciated the very simple and simplistic analysis coming from AF. They said, work hard first, society will reward you later. That sounds like a great place to live in. But you just portrayed at your deputy speech that that is not the world in which you live in. Even if you work hard every single day, even if you do everything that you can possibly and humanly do, sometimes your labor is not appreciated because that is how the world works. That is what you said in the beginning of your deputy speech. So then, that's why we began to challenge the lens by which you view hard work. That's why Ina and I said, when will you ever view this work to be hard when there is no structural change recognized 
recognizing the inherent value of work. That's even why Bart brought you the idea of blue collar and white collar labor, which by the way, they never even challenged. We think that there were so many ideas coming from Negbench, which they decided not to engage with. Instead, who said decided to talk for three minutes about the story of a successful black man, which by the way, I already told you could potentially be an outlier rather than the rule for how you eventually get out of poverty. Finally, if we take a look at the very, very best case scenario of these guys, it is day-to-day -day subsistence. But they never answer the question as to why day-to-day -day subsistence is sufficient, especially when this rhetoric is what has been driving intergenerational poverty. It is why my father, my grandfather, and my child will be poor, because you never challenge a structure that changes the valuation of what hard work truly is. We are proud to take this championship. I thank the opposition reply speaker. I now call on the government reply speaker. It's funny that Alan talked in his reply speech about how likely do you get the harms. Because the first question I want to ask is, which side really operationalized their policy? Because the consistent questioning that we had from the start is, how do you do the challenging the system, challenging the structures that you really want? They just said, well, we can challenge the system. It's going to be more likely. But when it comes to the crucial question of challenging and how do you do it, no response, Ateneo was mum. Conversely, we told you that challenging the system comes from my speech in a sense that you challenge the system by, 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 by passing that system, by transgressing that system in a sense that you're better than the system, that even if the system restricted you, you still are essentially successful at the end day. So as far as challenging the system is concerned, they never really had a clear cohere coherent stance, that's first, but secondly, you had to respond to my stance about challenging that system as well. We think as far as operationalization goes, government definitely takes the debate. Second, let's assess engagements. Because Ina's intro talked about people who were hard but weren't recognized. But doesn't that, that, doesn't that mean that she's agreeing you have to work hard first for all their values to accrue? What they had to be able to analyze was, was there ever a situation where people didn't work hard at all and people just pushed, people just pushed for reform? Conversely, we argued situations where people just worked hard and didn't have to push for reform. The Zan Zanbalin who were eventually organically accepted into that society even though they had, didn't have to organic reform. So they never really fulfilled their burden of engagement by just talking about those people who work hard but, didn't eventually, but uh, es essentially don't fight for the rights anyway. What you have to understand is that their burden here is for people or for these leaders to teach these people not to work hard at all. And if they're saying that they have to work hard first, that's a concession with government bench in this debate. Thirdly, they never really responded to the crucial nuances of the argumentation. When Alan came here and argued about the portrayal bit, like people are still going to be portrayed as bad, they had to be able again to respond to the nuances of our argumentation as far as portrayal is concerned. Because they had to disprove first why the portrayal we were talking about, that these people will be portrayed as crucial parts of your society, as crucial people, uh, people who fulfill a crucial role in your society, is essentially not true at the end day. So that's, that has to work for their idea of portrayal to work at the end day. Secondly, they said that people are going to see you in uh, people are going to see you in a good light. Uh, uh, people are going to see you in a good light under the structure. But again, this is under the frame that people have to work hard first because we posited already very consistently that if you don't work hard first to attain all the benefits coming from opposition, people are just going to see you as lazy slobs who block traffic in Edsa at the end day. Thirdly. Um, Alan talked about the idea that um, there's a contradiction. Well, just because Alan can analyze multiple situations doesn't necessarily mean there's a contradiction. In fact, Alan talked about the contradiction because it highlights the fact that there was never a response from opposition about my sustainability point. We agree that in the ideal world, people should be getting the rights, people should be getting the benefits. But the simple questions we ask is, what if it's not yet there? They said, people shouldn't be content with just subsistence. But what are they getting under opposition side? Not, not subsistence at all because people wouldn't be janitors because people are going to start waiting for what's essentially there at the end of the day. So number one, if it's not yet there, then opposition ultimately has to respond as first. But second, if government chooses to give it to you, but eventually takes it away, like what I analyzed in politically volatile situations, they had no response. Why not working hard is a crucial part. So ultimately what you have to understand is one, 
they never fulfill their burden because all of their defenses are contingent upon this idea that you have to work hard first, like what government wants in this debate. That's first. But second, um, they just said that there was a contradiction coming from thin air when they failed to respond to my crucial sustainability analysis. For all those reasons, Alan shouldn't be proud to take the championship because we're definitely bringing it home. I thank government reply speaker. You may now cross the house. All right, the judges have uh, deliberated in a concealed room and they have the results. So let's now call on the, uh, the chief adjudicator, Mr. Jake Bustos. Jake. And now to announce this year's national champion. So it was again, it was a 7-2 split. The champion of the Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championship 2014 is Opposition Ateneo A. All right, we would like to thank the UP Debate Society and the Asian Development Bank for making opposing views and Solar News Channel a part of this year's Philippine Intercollegiate Debate Championships. And that's our opposing views for tonight. Tune in again next week for another bold and engaging discussion on today's most relevant issues. This has been the 2014 Philippine Intercollegiate Debating Championships. I'm Rod Depomoceno. Good night and God bless.